I am Anil Kathet, associated as young professional with National Institute of Disaster Management. I welcome you all to the third webinar of five one day webinar series jointly hosted by National Institute of Disaster Management and World Health Organization. The theme of today's webinar is urban issues and COVID-19 management in densely populated settings. Urbanization is one of the leading global trends of the current century. Over 55% of the world population lives in urban areas, a portion that is expected to increase to 68 by 2050. The impact of global COVID-19 are still being understood, but it does seem clear that this crisis will make a mark on our urban areas that are densely populated physically and socially that will echo for generation. Many exiting approaches to planning, deployment, and management pertaining to communities, infrastructure, and natural resources would be under critical questions. Urbanization has always been a reflection of prevailing cultural and technological trends and even major crisis. For example, chlora epidemic in the 19th century sparked the introduction of modern urban sanitation system. Housing regulation around light and air were introduced as a major against respiratory disease in overcrowded slums in Europe during industrialization. In 1898, two years after the bubonic plague ravaged Bombay, the Bombay City Improvement Trust was established. The trust was formed to decongest the overcrowded old town through slum clearance drives, improve ventilation and sanitation, and to uh, provide housing to the poor. The COVID-19 pandemic COVID has already significantly altered urban life. The number of people moving around has dropped to unprecedentedly low levels. Work from home, mass, physical distancing are new normal. The fate of millions of small businesses and workers that make urban center work is up in the air. These changes have sparked a debate about how cities should build and perhaps more importantly, how they can better respond to current and future crisis. I hope today's webinar will be fruitful in brainstorming the current urban issues and also the solution to manage for the management of COVID-19, especially in densely populated urban areas. Now, I would request executive director of National Institute of Disaster Management, Major General Manoj Kumar Bindal, Mr. Seva Medal, to illuminate us with his key note address. He was commissioned in to the Corps of Army Air Defense in December 18, uh, 1985, and alumnus of National Defense Academy. Major General M.K. Bindal holds a master degree in defense and strategic study, as well as master of philosophy in defense and management studies. During his more than three decades of service, he has held more important command and staff assignments. He commanded an air defense regiment and an air defense brigade in Kashmir region against the backdrop of country insurg uh, insurgency operation. Major uh, General M.K. Bindal has also served as Director Center for United Nations Peacekeeping New Delhi and the Secretary of the International Association of Peacekeeping Training Centers. Over to you, sir. Hi, uh, the panelists I welcome by name. Uh, you can hear me? Yes, sir. Ah, okay, I'll start once again. Thank you, Anil, uh, for the brief introduction and starting this webinar. Uh, first, I'll welcome all the participants uh, who have joined this uh, webinar, as also the panelist, uh, Dr. Martina Spies, who's done most of her uh, work in Dharavi slums. And uh, so we will get a very good insight from her. And from WHO, we have Dr. Sachin Revaria and Dr. Saurabh Dalal, who we have heard earlier also. And from NIDM, Dr. Uh, Professor Surya Prakash. Uh, so uh, it will be a very fruitful seminar because the topic chosen is a very uh, uh, burning issue. Uh, today, uh, we are uh, aware that uh, it has uh, such a 
disaster has presents a very decidedly large urban challenge and it exposes the underlying vulnerability of the cities or densely populated areas uh, that we talk about uh, we were not prepared uh, we were not organized it took time to mobilize and start the process against such a large pandemic uh, disasters don't affect people equally it is the poorest who had get hit the hardest and this covid pandemic is no different in cities what happens is people don't notice because everyone is focused uh, not wrongly on their own basic needs but it is the people who are hidden away in the cities who suffer the most so as a society in times to come we will be measured by how we support the most vulnerable and let's not fail in that strengthening uh, pandemic preparedness is critical uh, to develop the urban resilience and the adaptive capacity of a city to fight such type of disasters one thing we must not forget that resilience is not about infrastructure it is about people and people are very strong and very resilient and they always write to the challenge in this case i will say the canvas of uh, uh, urban cities needs to be expanded to include uh, peri urban uh, rural to urban connections semi urban and tertiary cities also uh, because uh, they are the source of all the uh, congested areas that uh, affect the uh, rise of pandemic in the cities in urban cities we have a high density of population in the housing we have high density during commutations we have high density in any work environment and we have rapid influx from the rural uh, areas which they stay in a very poor housing uh, uh, conditions insufficient supply of fresh water poor sanitation facilities ineffective ventilation system and thereby the risk to them is increases and through them the risk to others also increases so this rapid urbanization Uh, has added to the problem also of interface between animals and humans because more number of humans in a given area the interface increases uh, it has also caused lot of uh, stress issues uh, we have uh, because of loss of business continuity loss of livelihood loss of a certain lifestyle uh, especially of the rich uh, elderly uh, and uh, the Uh, convalescing people who had a routine uh, whatever they used to follow like the elderly had a routine to keep uh, fit they used to go for 30 minutes of walk or uh, for stress uh, uh, related issues they used to get together in a park a few of them <coughs> and have half an hour 45 minutes of chat and come back that used to prepare them for the day uh, that all that suddenly stop so the stress levels are very high right now and the privacy issues now in a house no one is getting a privacy uh, everyone is clustered together from for 24 hours schools have not reopened children are exposed to uh, adults uh, uh, issues whether it be uh, house problems financial problems or uh, maybe uh, some uh, uh, tiff between them which they were earlier not exposed to so uh, they, they, this also causes a lot of stress and the main uh, problem that we have is the uncertainty uncertainty of the extent of this pandemic as to when it will end uh, will it graph go down and again research like in spanish flu or even if it ends after a second research third research Uh, how many years later again the similar thing can happen in a much worse form so this uncertainty is causing fear uh, and which is also uh, breaking down the semblance of the society uh, and uh, uh, we need to find ways and means to reduce the stress uh, so that uh, the output now that the economy is open now is not affected by that Uh, output is not affected by that uh, we now have over now four months of uh, substantial experience and expertise in preparing for and dealing with the health emergencies so now the plans for future uh, plans 
have to be now based on data which is practical and not empirical data of 100 years ago now we have data which is just four months old and the analysis will give us real uh, time uh, uh, recommendations there is room of uh, sharing the best practices and measures in urban settings which uh, uh, today we are doing because we have got experts who have been dealing with urban issues uh, uh, densely populated areas who will be sharing their thoughts on this so this topic which has been chosen is very apt and uh, a series of such talks is going to uh, help us understand the issue and drive home certain lessons with everyone i'm thankful to uh, who for collaborating with the nidm uh, to organize a series of such uh, webinars on such important topics which touch the roots of everyone's life and uh, i'm looking forward to listening to the speakers and the interaction with the participants thank you so much over to you anil kate thank you very much sir for your enlightening key notice uh, address for creating resilient urban we need more integrated city regional planning around economies energy provision transport network and food production so that these networks can become pillars of resilience rather than weak points such a planning approach will bring a broader and different set of stakeholders to the table creating a strong coalition for change today we have four distinguished speakers who will share their experiences and expertise with us our first speaker uh, is dr saurav dalal he is national professional officer emergency risk and crisis management world health emergency program with who country of country office of india he has a vast experience in the field of emergency and disaster medicine public health he has worked as a specialist medical preparedness and biological disaster with national disaster management authority ministry of home affairs government of india and had served as consultant in disaster health care uh, psychological care at national institute of disaster management dr sir uh, dr saurav dalal holds his specialization in the field of emergency medicine disaster management and public health he also served as a member of international medical commission of federation of international motor sport and chief medical officer for formula 1 india he has been involved in covid-19 crisis right from planning and beginning of response phase internationally and within india and has contributed to many advisories and guidelines on covid-19 over to you, sir so am i audible properly yeah you are audible okay so a very good morning to everyone i thank dr surya prakash uh, mr sindal biddal uh, for uh, giving such a brief uh, and nice introduction uh, coming back to nidm is like uh, coming back to the alma mater this is the place that i started my disaster management career and today we are very happy to uh, discuss on a one such pertinent issue which is regard to uh, covid-19 management in urban settlements so i will upload my presentation uh, while we are discussing this particular issue and uh, since i am going first i would like to uh, start with a small disclaimer that uh, probably this is one of an area and as well as a challenge in which uh, as ideally described in the book we also want a policy informed decision making to happen within the country and any policy that has been formed within the country if it happens with the help of uh, stakeholders that are involved even if we are making a policy for the slums if we have an idea of what they are going through and what they are thinking this could be a very very fruitful and a successful approach uh, that is what ideally in the field of health and disaster risk reduction we aim and we strive for so i will start my presentation uh, i have got a request from the last present uh, last in the that हाँ 
lot of people uh, ask questions regarding ROK Skip mobile app. So I will start a, a brief introduction with this mobile app. That, uh, the users wanted to know that what are the key ma major features that have been involved with ROK Skip app. So uh, this was the questions which has been raised in the past uh, webinars. So I would like to cover it first. So as we all know that uh, the ROK Skip app is now widely propagated by the government is one of the most effective technological intervention that has been and it has enabled us to deal with the COVID in, uh, with the help of technology. If you are already aware that it has crossed more than 100 million uh, user base, uh, the concerns that are existing in the society that regarding the data privacy and security has been very, very adequately addressed. Also, at the same time, the app is being uh, not just uh, being static, it has been constantly updated and, and value additions so that the entire applications become much more useful is being done on a very, very regular basis. So what does uh, ROG Setu usually basically uh, do for us? I'm going way into a detailed technicality. It gives you a very good national picture of uh, what is the COVID-19 cases across the country. It gives you a geographical area wise uh, allocations of cases as well. Uh, Though we might feel that it might not capture the data perfectly, but it is a very good initiative to uh, maintain social distancing, to get an alert when somebody who is tested positive comes into the database. And this app can be only be very successful. And this app can be only be very successful. Uh, so I would request everyone to uh, kindly uh, turn off the mic, please. I'm getting an echo. And the data that has been going on uh, from the National Center for Disease Control, the surveillance portal, are, is also being uh, coordinated with the ROG Situ app. Hence, it is a very, very uh, authenticated data. Now, since a lot of people are using it, a lot of section on frequently asked questions, mythbusters, videos that are coming, uh, and how to use ROG Situ app is also being uploaded on a daily basis. In fact. And this is probably one of the apps that I have seen in most recent times is coming up with most of the high end sophistication being integrated in a very short period of time. So very frequent updates and a lot of new things are also being added now. Uh, so that in the version 2.0, which is supposed to come in next few days, we'll have a major drastic change and uh, is much more focused on like when we ease the lockdown, how would this be? <laughs> so I go back to my original topic. Transmission of COVID-19 in urban settlements, slums, densely populated area. Uh, when COVID-19 entered the country, if you pick up the newspapers, it has been a unanimous voice that uh, in any densely populated settings across the world, any disease has spread like a wildfire. This too was uh, supposed to happen with uh, such a high level of infectivity in COVID-19. Uh, this the similar mechanism was expected and is still expected. So how did uh, we turn around that? The transmission dynamics of uh, COVID-19, if we uh, most of the cases are household attack rates, it suggests that 10% in the earlier outbreak and it fell to 3% with faster outbreak. And transmission is happening very fast within family clusters, that is 75% to 85% of the cases uh, are happening in and within the family. Now, if you look at the uh, particularity of urban settlements, uh, they are highly susceptible and they can become a serious spreaders of COVID-19. The reason is, imagine a family of five living in a four by four square feet area stacked upon each other. And then to imagine in a place like Aravi, and not just Aravi, but almost each and every tier one, tier two, tier three cities, as well as the rural part of the country, as such slums. We know the slums and urban densely populated settlements as area where they are too congested. The problem with the policymakers has been very traditional. We go with the baseline that they don't have anything; they lack certain services. But we have never done an approach while making a policy making to really understand that. For example, uh, starting off with a blank slate, I would just ask a simple uh, question and that would be just a guess. 
we all can assume that the slums across the country would have a very poor hand washing facility and most of them would not have a hand washing station so that is what the policy making thinks at the national level now how we turn this around is a case study so why uh, this uh, slums are highly vulnerable because these informal settlements and slums are unplanned many are overcrowded with uh, both neighborhood and household level they have very limited public space lack of access to the basic services water sanitation hygiene they use common facilities for the, for doing certain uh, day to day activities and also is integrated with a huge amount of whether it's migrant population or daily workers population or uh, people who are temporarily living in the slums or who are permanently occupying those slums as well now what are the major risk factors the, there is a higher rate of transmissibility of this disease within this particular areas there is a higher concentration of marginalized and migrants and forcefully displaced population the case fatality can also be higher because these people are also vulnerable to malnutrition inadequate hygiene and they are also affected already by certain other healthcare conditions so and the, there is a very high prevalence of uh, severe disease like uh, with comorbidities tuberculosis hypertension and other risk factors and also their lifestyle modification uh, lifestyle with regards to tobacco alcohol consumption is higher in these areas hence a lot of communicable non communicable diseases are also uh, prevalent in these communities there are adequate amount of gender inequalities which are also noted down in these areas and it is perceived or overall as well the risk perception behavior in this particular areas are considered to be very very low now so that was the big challenge when we uh, when the covid 19 response began in the country we at the very beginning phase we started regarding thinking about how the risk perception within the community should be measured and we went around with it uh, in a very systematic approach what we did was uh, before making a policy within the ministry of health and family welfare and we assisted ministry of health and family welfare in developing a policy around uh, the management of covid-19 in urban settlement because it would be entirely different to manage it in other containment zones other societies resident welfare associations and it would be an altogether a very different strategy because if you look at a very small example uh, just within a uh, Three and a half square kilometer. If seven hundred thousand people are residing, it's an extremely difficult situation to manage. So, looking taking these things into consideration, we did a risk perception survey uh, within ten uh, major slum clusters across the country. The methodology that we uh, it was called a urban slum survey, and uh, it was rolled out as a part of the social listening system with the help of WHO and UNICEF. Uh, what we did was uh, we also this time introduced one of the newest technology uh, if you are aware about the traditional survey mechanisms it is usually being done by a questionnaire a survey form or a google form which then culminates into and uh, 16 pages and then you have to press a submit button to make this thing much more easier uh, we invested in a chatbot based survey mechanism which would just like a chatbot based interaction and would complete within a fraction of seconds so this was one of very newer methodology and the survey could be widely popularized by sending a whatsapp link so this was also the time where we can think that how technology and newer innovations can be a part of uh, the covid management the chatbot also we was able we was able to be customized in seven different languages so it was customized to a lot of languages which were prevalent in these slums and specifically major languages like hindi marathi bengali odia tamil every uh, major languages were covered and then the survey was carried out across 10 locations across the country and with a confidence level of 95% a very interesting uh, uh, the outcomes were noted after the survey so a lot of people uh, were not very much confident 
about whether COVID-19 is a disease or a virus. They, uh, the slum population also had very major risk perception deficit that the COVID-19 uh, COVID disease can happen to anyone else, but no one within the family. And that is not just limited to slum because that is the mentality of the entire global population that even a disaster or a disease can happen to someone else, but it cannot happen to you and your family. So this was the similar uh, risk perception that we uh, apprehended from the uh, this community living in urban settlements. Uh, also, a, a major uh, shock for us as we uh, went along with the research that the community was quite aware about the not the symptoms, the type of which uh, the transmission happens, the way that disease spreads, and they were very apt to it. So the initial publicity with regards to symptom and uh, the mode of transmission done by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and media, it, social media also played a very big role into that. It uh, ultimately uh, gave a very good amount of knowledge base to the people, even living in slums, because, because of WhatsApp forwards and other methodologies, they were quite aware. But much to our concern, they were also uh, very much uh, confident about the helpline of government when they required to uh, help, when they required help. So even when we inquired about the most trusted sources of information, a majority of uh, community said that the local community doctor would be one of the most trusted, uh, whether it's, uh, we can say in a language called quack, or a local doctor which is very nearby to them and which the community visits them on a nearby or a regular basis is one of the most trusted uh, source for them. So that is why even in the plan and the ministry document that we made, we made an inclusive approach to address the issues of this community through this particular group as well. So they were also uh, very much uh, aware about the other social media platforms like WhatsApp, radio, Ministry of Health and Family website, as well as television was also one of the major way of uh, making the information reach them. So very little chance, 94% of the people thought that uh, their family is not, uh, cannot get uh, COVID-19. So one of the major surprise that came to us and which even policymaker also took a note of was people living in slum, 85% of them didn't have issue with regards to hand washing machine. So hand washing station or wash basins. What actually they wanted was more soaps, sanitizers, liquids and regular water supply. So we, everybody, uh, agencies, thinking on installing hand washing stations and other uh, modalities in those areas was not supposed to be, uh, it was supposed to be a very high uh, investment thing, but then would not be a very fruitful if this survey would not have been uh, highlighting that thing. So health seeking behavior was overall high, but still uh, not very much in the urban settlements. And the major concern even emerged in this community was uh, regards to stigma and discrimination that would happen to them once they are back from the treatment or once they are taken to the treatment and what would happen to, with their families. So these issues were, are, were stigmatizing them a lot. And when it was asked that, uh, again for much of a surprise, when it was asked that will you be able to maintain a distance of one meter uh, and will you be able to maintain a social distancing in these areas? Majority of them said yes. And this was what has also helped us in winning war in these areas. Ultimately, as policymakers, what we think that it is impossible to maintain a social distance in this particular area. But if community itself is involved in the response, then the results are altogether different. So I will not take much time. 80% of respondents cooperate with healthcare workers while they are seeking information and 11% of the respondents felt that the healthcare workers were anyway trying to blame the community for spread and infection and by not sharing any data with them. So what were the key uh, takeaways from this uh, survey? 
the, there was a very low risk perception and, and practice of behaviors, physical distancing, and hygiene within the slum. The slum color knowledge gaps and, and concerns related to COVID-19 detection and treatment are hindering early reporting and health-seeking behaviors. And their concerns suggest high fear issues related to family access to food in their absence, taking of the family due to separation, prevalence of stigma at the community level. And they were also willing that the, if the government is able to increase the ground level healthcare model within the slums, it would be of much more help. They can stay near to their family and everybody get treatment. And that is the exact thing which has been translated into a policy. So after uh, getting those response, we started working on it and we analyzed that uh, there cannot be a customized uh, single way approach to address issues in all the slums. So we need to contextualize the response plan in each and every urban settlements, whether it's small, big, notified, unnotified, or is populated by any sort of migrant workers or any slum dwellers. So we, it was very clear that we have to contextualize it. We have to have an inclusive approach, leaving no one behind. And I understand in that and also yeah, develop and implement multi-sectoral micro plans. It is not just about the healthcare mechanism, the water and sanitation department, the urban uh, municipal corporations, everyone needed to be a part of it. We also wanted to do it in a proper way. Therefore, the concept of disaster management, like incident response system and uh, other concepts of disaster management was also uh, in incorporated into that. And when you implement this strategy, uh, it has to be uh, an engaging approach by engaging the communities in it. So, what happened after that was a real. On 16th of May, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare released a document on preparedness and response to COVID 19 in urban settlements. And when this was the, one of the first documents which has been released in the series of all the guidelines that has been developed with the help of risk informed policy making. So this is a, an ideal context which we think can read in all the books. And how do we translate this into an action plan? So we translated this entire policy into steps that are being taken in uh, slums across the country. So we provide technical support on surveillance strategy, roll out assessment, understand health, wash behavior chain needs in the slum hotspots. Multi-sectoral, community-based micro-planning with regards to risk communication activities, infection prevention and control, WASH, and uh, also develop and contextualize training materials with regards to how to do management in urban settlements with regards to and, and Also develop simple and practical standard operating pro uh, procedures and checklist. Installation of uh, non touching hand washing stations and developing focused uh, risk communication materials. For example, uh, if we, when we talk about recently uh, in Delhi, uh, there, is, there, is a lot of, there are a lot of clusters where a focused risk communication has to be done. And that is an immediate need which is currently ongoing in their local language. And that is the even uh, demand from the community itself. Engage the faith based community leaders and self help groups and local influencers and uh, facilitate local solutions. One of the uh, local solutions that we have uh, seen coming from the slum was the slums that are affected or are in a containment zone, they themselves can boost their capacity by ma making a huge amount of making a huge mask and uh, handmade uh, homemade sanitizers with, by following adequate guidelines and innovations in way of living. For example, uh, a very funny but also uh, practical, practical part uh, of a solution is that if uh, people are living in uh, slums, then uh, in the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare guideline, it has been advised that two people living in the slums and uh, sharing the same space while sleeping should uh, sleep uh, in opposite directions. So these are few things that re reduces your risk. And of course, in the long run, a lot of community awareness and awareness. And at the end of the entire implementation mechanism, we uh, stressed on having an accountability and feedback mechanism 
to ensure that the steps that we decided are to be implemented in a the results that we need to success was uh, mentioned in yesterday's newspaper that how Dharavi Asia is one of the most crowded countries coronavirus and has lessons for others. So this is what happens when a decision risk informed policy making happens and is implemented and no disease big or small if it is uh, built in a proper way or a, a proper science it would definitely yield out to certain results. There were I cannot say that there were no challenges while we started the interventions in this uh, slums and it, the interventions in other slums as well. But as we move on, we have for several new challenges. But uh, if we deal it with a uh, risk mechanism, we will be able to deal it in a very proper way. A lot more needs to be done, and the fight against coronavirus is still on for a long, long time. So thank you very much for patiently listening to me and we will be taking the questions whatever you have at the end of the presentation as well after all the speakers. Thank you. Thanks Dr. Dalal for providing insights on Arugya Setu app and other facets of urban challenges in wake of COVID-19 and strategies to manage those challenges. Today, we have privilege of having honorable member NDMA Sri Krishna Vatsa. Sri Krishna Vatsa has worked in the area of disaster risk reduction and recovery for the last 25 years. Prior to joining as member NDMA, Krishna Vatsa worked as policy advisor, disaster recovery bureau for policy and program support, UNDP in New York and Nairobi during 2015 to 20. He served as the Regional Disaster Reduction Advisor South and Southwest Asia in New Delhi from 2008 to 2014. He joined UNDP in 2007 as Early Recovery Coordinator in the Philippines. As a career, uh, uh, career of civil servant, Krishna Vatsa joined the Maharashtra Emergency Earthquake Rehabilitation Program in the state of Maharashtra, India in 1995. Implemented a large-scale earthquake recovery program during the next four years. He also served as secretary to the government of Maharashtra Relief and Rehabilitation from 2003 to 2006. I welcome him in the webinar and would request him to spare five minutes from his valuable time to share his experiences on management of COVID-19, especially in densely populated urban areas. Before I hand over the mic uh, to honorable member and DMA, it is requested to all the participants kindly do not unmute your mic so that there is no hindrance in smooth functioning of the webinar. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and this opportunity to share my views. Um, it's uh, Corona and uh, important to discuss uh, and, and most of the uh, the cases are actually uh, concentrated in urban areas. So uh, um, it ought to discuss the issue of uh, uh, relationship between the density and the incidence of uh, coronavirus. Uh, density is uh, uh, the the level of infection and mortality a function of uh, of density you know density increases the probability of transmission uh, and uh, um, um, uh, i think you know the, what we call the r rate you know goes up in the densely populated areas so we see a much larger uh, case load in In India, I think there is a lot of uh, variation. Uh, Mumbai, of course, has the highest uh, transmission uh, and the highest number of deaths. Um, I think it's definitely a, a, a function of the density. Um, Delhi um, is now the, the, the case load is in. We have uh, about 41,000 cases. Here, the deaths are about 1,327. 
but if we see two other cities and i'm not including kolkata deliberately because you know uh, uh, there is some misgiving about uh, the the data emanating from from west bengal uh, but if we just consider two other cities chennai and bangalore i think uh, we have a different story um chennai uh, the i think the cases are increasing but the number of deaths is is much lower you know the in, entire tamil nadu i think the number of deaths is about around 500 and in bangalore uh, uh, the the total number of cases is around 7000 i think it, um, this is the figure for entire karnataka uh, bangalore is, is still much lower and the the total number of deaths is 86 uh of course in mumbai have, but you know these cities again chennai and bangalore uh, are also quite dense you know so um, i think a, a lot needs to be explained in terms of the what about kerala of course uh, is a, is a totally different case Uh, uh, it it does not have a metro city so i am not referring to kerala i am just referring to the big cities here um so um, um the um, one important variable is the is how early you have implemented the uh, social distancing means you know how how uh, soon you have implemented the the uh, the restrictions and uh, that always makes a difference and then there are other issues which are related to the provision of the healthcare services uh, the the provision of the quarantine facilities and uh, and um, the 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 provision of beds in the hospital these are all important factors but the most important factor is how successfully how effectively you have implemented the social distancing measures this is the most important thing that makes the difference well of transmission um, um the, uh, the if you just look at uh, the transmission worldwide also and and look at some of the uh, uh, new york has badly hurt and new york is one of the most densely populated cities in the world uh, it has about 18000 deaths you know uh, the total number of infection is about 210000 new york um so um uh, new york badly suffered uh, in i think it's the most affected city in in us and perhaps uh, in the entire world um but if you compare uh, in in new york with san francisco you see a very totally different story san francisco has a much lower uh, much lower um, infection and the deaths are uh, still in in two digits you know uh, i think its total number of deaths is around uh, 35 uh and san francisco is the second uh, most densely populated city so uh one thing that should be said uh, in favor of san francisco that they introduced the social distancing measures and all the restrictions much early and they allowed the their health department to take all the containment measures uh, right in the beginning and i think that really paid off if you look at some of the other cities also which are very dense you know uh, i i will refer to hong kong which has uh, just four deaths and hong kong's density is, is very very comparable to density of any indian city you know uh, hong kong just um, um, escaped four deaths and uh, the uh, and uh, the region that really explains the the lower number of deaths uh, and lower transmission in hong kong is the is the community education and uh, how the people were prepared how the communities were prepared of course they had the advantage of dealing with the 
with the um, epidemic in the past so they were they had a much higher level of information and education and they uh, at the community level i think they uh, they uh, impose this uh, uh, all the preventive measures such as masks and hand and hand washing um, and uh, they could contain it very successfully despite the fact that they had some many, many issues with with the government and the government initially was not very enthusiastic about implementing these social distancing measures so it was just the community initiative that um, um, introduced all the measures and uh, they could contain that so um, worldwide the um, uh, i mean the experience is this that the earlier we introduced the the social distancing measures um, the uh, and emphasize and the the hand washing and and masks i think the easier it was to to contain it the second thing the second i think that is very very important is how you involve the communities and the uh, the, the social cohesion or the the community cohesion that that definitely plays an important role if the communities come together and and i think they 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 face it uh, together uh, they have a much greater um, prospect of of success in being with uh, uh, covid 19 the governments are also uh, far more successful in in containing um, covid 19 when they seek the confidence of the people when they 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 start talking to the people and they uh, they them into confidence so it's important to to uh, talk to the government and and uh, uh, talk to the community and seek their compliance so um, it has to be a community based fight uh, it has to be uh, a, a decentralized fight where you you galvanize you bring together all the local level functionaries and communities together so um, the very important is that we uh, we introduce, introduce certain crisis uh, management mechanisms uh, we have uh, you know uh, we set up all the important facilities such as you know um, the the home the home isolation social uh, the, the the local quarantine facilities the people and you encourage the people if they are and in the process you uh, you make all the arrangements say arrangements for food um arrangements for uh, say uh, you know taking care of their other daily needs um, so wherever the governments have been able to uh, uh, work closely with the with the local governments with the communities together i think uh, they have been able to neutralize this factor of density and they have been able to contain the the transmission i think uh, uh, saurav just referred to uh, the successful example of dharavi dharavi has just turned around a corner and it's really a great example how the 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 local administration and communities have come together and how they have taken care of many of the local needs you know for example you know i, I was just reading that you know there a lot of muslim population observing you know roza so the 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 government would provide for you know, food uh, in the evening you know when they would break the fast so some of these measures really you know go a long way in winning the confidence of the communities um and they have been able to set up the quarantine facilities and the testing facilities so people know that you know if they are in trouble the help is is very close by and they can they, they can access the government services so um uh the the key uh, the government's working closely with the communities uh, setting up all the facilities setting up the crisis management uh, mechanisms and uh, uh, educating the communities more and more about all the preventive measures um i think you know we we have the, these lessons are very relevant as we go forward the fight is still uh, going on we are in the midst of the fight 
but uh, I think we have enough lessons from the world around that we can neutralize uh, some of these uh, uh, the, the increased risks emanating from the density of the population. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for sharing the current COVID-19 situation in densely populated mega cities of India and the scenario of mega cities around the globe, and also about the significance of implementing the preventive measures guidelines for the containment of the COVID-19. Thanks also for sharing the role of community in dealing with COVID-19. The key to successful containment of such pandemic is the seamless communication between people between uh, local people and concerned authorities who implement the strategies to contain such pandemics. Thank you very much, sir. Now, I, I would like to invite our second uh, speaker of the day, Dr. Sachin Revaria. Dr. Sachin Revaria is a medical graduate from Maulana Azad Medical College, Delhi University, and a postgraduate in Health Administration from National Institute of Health and Family Welfare, New Delhi. He has 20 years of experience in public health practice in India as well as countries in Southeast Asia, Africa, Western Pacific region of World Health Organization. He is an active member of India, Indian Academy of Pediatric and Indian Medical Association and holds a special interest in capacity building for strengthening of health systems, technical writing, and evaluation of health programs. Over to you, Dr. Revaria. Dr. Revaria, are you there? Dr. Sachin Revaria. Can you hear me? Yeah, now you we can, can hear you. You can hear me? Okay, yeah. great. Uh, technology issues. Let me try and share my presentation. Is the uh, presentation visible? Yes, sir, it's visible. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, thanks to uh, uh, Sri uh, Krishna Vatsaji and Major General uh, Bindal for setting out the tone and uh, also Dr. Uh, Saurabh Dalal for uh, briefing us on what uh, WHO and some of the partners are uh, doing to tackle urban issues uh, in the context of uh, COVID-19. I will uh, briefly take you through uh, uh, what is happening in Delhi as a uh, case study. Uh, so, uh, uh, just to uh, set the tone, uh, Delhi uh, has a population of around 20 million uh, with 11 districts uh, and uh, a good uh, presence of uh, the WHO field network. Uh, COVID healthcare network uh, still expanding, uh, some issues there, you would be hearing about it in the news, but it's uh, expanding uh, quite fast now. Uh, if we see the data as of uh, yesterday, around uh, more than 42,000 positive cases uh, and the number of new cases every day uh, actually going up over the uh, past couple of uh, days and uh, where we stand is that uh, as of now most of the uh, active cases as on today around 78% uh, plus are on home isolation and uh, there are some containment zones uh, which as of yesterday stand at around 242. Uh, I was looking at a question from uh, Mr. Venkata Ratnam uh, that uh, we are hearing uh, community transmission in some cities, but uh, we don't hear uh, if it is community transmission in India. Now, uh, if uh, I show you uh, two slides, 
uh, on what are the case numbers in high burden states. Uh, here I have put uh, the states that uh, all the previous speakers have referred to, which is Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Delhi, Gujarat, Uttar Pradesh. And if we see the case numbers in high burden cities like Mumbai, Delhi, Chennai, Ahmedabad, Indore, we will see that most of the cases are contributed by uh, these cities. Most of the cases in the state are contributed by certain cities. Uh, if we go to the city of Delhi, uh, here on the uh, left, I am showing uh, the number of cases across each of the 11 uh, districts of Delhi. And on the right is the number of deaths in absolute numbers. And you will see that, uh, you know, the uh, dark colors are showing uh, more number of cases or on the death map, more number of uh, deaths. The brown in the deaths being more than 100 deaths. So the disease is not equally spread across Delhi. Uh, we try to uh, look at it in a different way. Uh, by saying what is the number of cases per million population and number of deaths for every thousand cases. We again see that the scenario is very different. The north, western and the central part of Delhi appearing to be more affected. Uh, on this map, I am uh, showing uh, areas with large outbreaks each such area having more than 15 cases uh, showing as a dot on the on the map and you can see very clearly that uh, the number of dots the density of the dots is again uh, very high in a certain part of delhi uh, age and gender this is uh, similar to india where you know uh, population between 20 years and 59 years is uh, more affected and uh, if we see by gender 65 percent of the reported cases are males and hindus are accounting for around 94 uh, percent of the reported cases uh, now uh, when we talk of uh, the disease uh, problem in delhi you will see that uh, the growth rate uh, for COVID-19 stands at around 4.6% uh, as against India, which is around 4.1%, slightly higher. Uh, if we see the doubling rate, uh, which is through this uh, light brown uh, line, the uh, doubling rate for Delhi stands at around uh, 14 days and as against uh, India, which is around 16, uh, upwards of 16, around 17 days. So uh, Delhi is uh, has uh, some uh, uh, more intense transmission as compared to India. But if uh, you refer to my previous slide, that it's not all of uh, Delhi, it's only parts of Delhi. So uh, there is some intense transmission happening in a part of Delhi not the uh, entire Delhi and this is the reason why we are probably not saying that there is community transmission in India or in Delhi because it's not the entire country or the entire state or the entire city which appears to be having a uh, very strong transmission it's part of uh, the country or the or the city what is interesting is uh, what did the lockdown do and uh, these lines that you see going from top to bottom are signifying uh, uh, are signifying the uh, lockdowns. And uh, at the time of the first lockdown, when lockdown one around 25th of uh, uh, March, when it happened, uh, our doubling rate stood at around 4.3 days. And if that had continued, uh, at this time, we would be seeing around uh, 15 lakh cases, but we stand at uh, only 42,000 uh, as of uh, now. So the lockdown has had some effect in uh, reducing the uh, spread of the disease, and it can only be continued now uh, if 
these uh, non pharmaceutical or the public health interventions of uh, physical distancing and uh, hand hygiene and uh, cough etiquettes they can be uh, followed uh, this is uh, uh, what everybody in delhi wants to uh, hear where are we whether does delhi have uh, adequate number of beds as of now uh, what about the ventilator beds what about the oxygen beds what is uh, the status of expansion of health facilities i will talk about expansion later but as on today uh, around 46 percent of the uh, available beds are occupied so there is uh, still beds available and uh, the government of delhi in consultation with the uh, uh, union government is making uh, very rapid efforts at expansion of all these uh, capacities so delhi government has uh, made a lot of uh, initiatives which includes expanding the uh, frontline workforce expansion in the number of beds uh, purchase of equipment like oxygen concentrators trying to streamline the uh, hospital admissions uh, the uh, home isolated uh, cases you now for their uh, for screening of their health pulse oximeters being provided to the home isolation teams regular capacity building of uh, of the uh, healthcare staff uh, but there are challenges delhi is unique delhi has uh, not one but multiple health systems uh, those who have uh, worked in Delhi or interacted with the, the health systems would understand that uh, various health systems include NDMC, MCD, Delhi government, central government, defense, ESI and so on and so forth. Uh, and when there are multiple health agencies, there is a fragmented administrative control. Uh, the instructions that are passed from the national or the uh, or, or the uh, state level, uh, they take time to get implemented. Uh, there are densely populated areas, uh, as we have heard from the previous uh, speakers. The contact tracing has not been uh, up to uh, the expected uh, level. There is a lot of stigma and fear in the uh, community. Uh, and if I talk about uh, uh, this, uh, this thing, uh, if you remember the Delhi map, the uh, northeastern part of Delhi, uh, is uh, is having a very very uh, uh, densely populated areas uh, density to the extent of 40,000 uh, persons per square kilometer, but it's uh, throwing up uh, very less cases. Uh, does it have something to do with availability of uh, healthcare facilities in the close vicinity? Stigma uh, is yet to be determined, but uh, we're ex expecting uh, more cases from densely populated areas. There are apprehensions amongst uh, healthcare staff uh, to the extent that you know, uh, uh, there is fear amongst the healthcare staff of getting infected. Uh, uh, this is where partners come in, and uh, partners have very aptly supported uh, the state government, uh, more so in monitoring uh, what is the preparedness of the health facilities. Uh, also helping uh, on how the response should go about in these urban slums or urban settlements. Uh, the social listening survey that you have seen Dr. Saurabh Dalal present uh, was an initiative from partners. So uh, that those are the, uh, then epidemiological data collection uh, through case investigation forms, training the clinicians, getting the data, collating it, analyzing it and sharing with the state and union governments for taking timely, uh, evidence-based actions that has been uh, done by the partners. Very recently, some very strong initiatives have been taken. As of now, uh, Delhi stands at a lab testing capacity of around 5,000 per day, but uh, there is a very strong commitment now to increase it uh, within a couple of days to around 20,000 per day. The government of India is providing uh, support for this. Uh, the house to house survey in containment zones uh, for active surveillance and uh, looking for uh, cases. Uh, uh, the uh, resolve is through this app called Assess Corona uh, to complete the survey within uh, one week. In the COVID facilities where uh, you know, concerns were being raised on the quality of care 
and uh, apprehensions about apathy and fear amongst the healthcare staff. Uh, closed circuit televisions are being installed uh, in the next few days in the COVID facilities. Uh, jumbo facilities uh, with a capacity of around 17,000 beds are being created in Delhi. The union government has uh, pro is going to provide around 500 railway coaches with around 8,000 beds, uh, uh, which is going to be functional very soon. COVID hospitals are being uh, designated more and more. Hindu Rao Hospital and uh, Municipal Corporation Hospital has been recently designated as COVID hospital. And there were also concerns that the small nursing homes uh, that have uh, been asked to provide uh, facilities uh, to COVID patients, uh, but uh, they were not willing, they did not have the capacity. So the government has actually uh, excused them uh, from, uh, uh, from this uh, network. So uh, nursing homes with less than 50 beds need not be a part of uh, uh, the, the, uh, these facilities. And there are a lot of uh, 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 actions that need to be uh, taken, uh, some of which uh, uh, way has been paved already. Quality of contact tracing, already government has taken action on that. Uh, intensification of surveillance activities will come through that uh, quality contact tracing. Enhancing of testing capacity already being done. Uh, uh, decisions have been uh, taken on that. Uh, for health system response, uh, uh, this is interesting and uh, the government has looked at this and this presentation was prepared day before yesterday, but uh, today I see the government having taken a lot of uh, these actions uh, uh, already. Uh, oxygen supported beds uh, being provided uh, follow up for home isolation cases uh, through the uh, Assess Corona app and dedicated HR support, capacity building of the health workforce, uh, then uh, uh, risk communication and IC activities, and uh, essential healthcare services uh, to be uh, to be uh, resumed. Uh, now, uh, in containment zones. Uh, and uh, this is uh, where I'm coming from when I say that uh, the transmission is not across the state, but in certain parts. So uh, in the containment zones, uh, we uh, need to ensure that uh, survey quality uh, and uh, planning and active surveillance is at the highest level. Uh, perimeter control is, uh, is well uh, implemented. Uh, availability of essential supplies uh, is ensured, although it was coming through uh, the social listening survey that this is not a big concern, but uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, uh, effective perimeter control is not well implemented. So uh, this needs to be uh, well uh, implemented and timely sharing of information with all stakeholders. So this is uh, going to be uh, key and, uh, and uh, that's where uh, WHO is also supporting at the state as well as uh, national level so that uh, uh, these uh, activities are well implemented and uh, we can uh, see a similar uh, result as we have seen for Dharavi in Mumbai. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for sharing the case study on urban issues and COVID-19 situation from New Delhi. The COVID-19 is not uniformly distributed in Delhi. Uh, you also share the status of healthcare sector in Delhi, some challenges in Delhi, like complex health uh, system, intersectoral coordination, is stigma and fear in community, as well as inadequate case reporting and recent initiatives, plus probably future studies for overcoming these challenges. Now, I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Martina Spice. She is an architect, social designer, builder, and activist. She holds doctorate in architecture and urban designing different neighborhoods within Dharavi, which is one of the Dennis most complex and largest informal settlement in Mumbai. In her research called Dharavi Places and Identities, Martina analyzed the complex connection between Dharavi and the home villages of its inhabitants. She is founder of organization. She is founder of organization Anukriti that builds playground on vacant urban sites within informal settlements in the mega city Mumbai and beyond. She has gained experience in international offices uh, such as from Japan, 
coach for BV uh, Doshi Hasmukh Patel in India. Between 2013 to 2016, she was the head of research project, ground up uh, uh, dwellers focused design tools for upgrading living space in Tharawai, Mumbai. Maitena is the author of various international publications about children and play in informal settlements within Mumbai and beyond. Over to you, ma'am. Hello, good afternoon. <laughs> I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, ma'am. Yes, so is my presentation visible too? Is it visible? Uh, not yet, ma'am. Uh, not yet. It should be a uh, wait. Wait, ma'am. Wait. Okay, now it should come. Yes, ma'am. Visible, ma'am. Yes, great, great. So good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> I'm not a doctor. I'm a I'm an, an urban designer and an architect. As my lovely introduction, thank you so much. And. Um, I keep it very crisp and short, my presentation. We have already heard so much uh, wonderful and uh, useful information. I would like to talk a little bit about uh, learning from Tharavi in Mumbai. Uh, I've been connected uh, with this informal settlement for many years. My com uh, complete field work happened there and I met especially a lot of uh, girls and women and uh, I'm still very much in contact with a lot of dwellers there. And uh, of course, I have uh, the real ground up uh, information. And I would like to start with very brief facts about Haravi. Uh, I don't want to call Haravi as a slum. Uh, it is an informal settlement in the middle of the mega city. And uh, it's a very, very uh, dense, but also a very complex informal settlement within the world, not only within India. And uh, heads off uh, of the, uh, for all the dwellers of Taravi who built up this, this uh, settlement from zero and from scratch. And uh, Taravi is not uh, only local, it's also global. So as you know, many, uh, many international companies are also connected with Taravi's economy. And um, at the moment, uh, due COVID-19, one third of its inhabitants went off to their home villages. And uh, it is a very, very dense settlement. Around 1 million people live on 2.1 square kilometers of land. And uh, total cases uh, from the source of B BMC June 12th are around 2,000. And uh, there was a very sharp spike of 380% from April to May. 77 people unfortunately died uh, and 29 cases of the day uh, of June 12th. Uh, and the challenge is not only to reduce the number of patients, but also to increase the number of discharges. That's the biggest challenge. And uh, the Mantini Day, uh, uh, yeah, she's she's a journalist and uh, she uh, wrote this wonderful line. However, Harabi, as, as is the cruel irony of this situation, is far more privileged than many other slums of India, which are barely even being noticed. It is just a canary in a coal mine, indicative of many problems that urban poor are facing across India. And of course, Harabi is in each and every media and uh, it uh, you, we listen every day, nearly every day, to Taravi's um, stories, Taravi's journey to becoming Mumbai's COVID hotspot, or how Taravi is fighting the virus, strictest implementation of lockdown. And uh, it's also, you know, a lot of, of course, here you, you can see uh, the density of Taravi. Mumbai is already so dense. And then Taravi, 8.69 lakh of people per square mile. Mumbai is 76.79 uh, lakh of people in uh, per uh, uh, yeah 0 0.82 square miles. So the density is extreme, and Tarabi is also very very um, uh, well known for its location. It's in the middle uh, of the city, and that's why it is also very very prominent. Also in Austria, I'm basically from Austria. Austria was also full. Uh, in the newspapers about Harabi, about India. 
and uh, not only bad, but also good things, what we will discuss uh, later on. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we all see very striking pictures every day in the newspapers and also in the TVs, on the TVs here from the Washington Post. So no entry, no Corona. So of course, uh, Tarabi is a containment zone right now. And um, what I find very special about Harabi that people there are very disciplined and uh, they find uh, each and every inch uh, in Harabi uh, is very, very controlled by its inhabitants. And still, especially children and women find tiny little relaxation areas for themselves. And uh, as, we, as we also heard in our first presentation, I found it very interesting uh, Sir uh, told us about, you know, small little, of course, uh, physical distancing is nearly impossible in, an, uh, in a settlement like Tarabi, but small little interventions like sleeping, you know, not head, uh, next, next to each other by head, uh, head to head, but, you know, turn your body around. And all these little small interventions can help a lot in a spatial setup like Tarabi. And what is the current situation? Social distancing is all but impossible, where multiple people live together in tiny rooms and residents have no option but to rely on public toilets. The strategy for the area focuses on screening and isolating potential patients. The city formed teams of doctors and volunteers to go door to door checking for people with symptoms. More than 100,000 people have been screened. The Gavkasa say, said, and nearly 2,500 have been placed in government-run quarantine facilities. All of Tarabi's more than 450 public toilets are being disinfected daily. This is uh, a source from the Washington Post one month back, May 11, 2020. We will uh, also uh, listen to other numbers then as well, how strong Tarabi has gone. So what are the current challenges? Most of Tarabi's problems are structural. The lack of space for social distancing, poor sanitation, the infrastructure, and still around 500 people share one public toilet and up to eight residents in a house have to share the facility too. And water was, especially women and girls, as the weakest groups within Tarabi suffer from the lack of safe and hygienic spaces. These problems have existed for years but the arrival of COVID-19 have intensified them. Tarabi is a containment zone, zone as we discussed before, and its people suffer from a social and economic stigma. That's, that's also a, a very big problem. Media uh, is a big factor in that, stigmatizing Tarabi. And uh, I found one comment in the message is very interesting that the media also plays a huge role in the whole COVID-19 problem. And uh, I would also like to say, um, I would like to uh, show you three people, three very close friends now uh, of mine. We've been working together on playgrounds, on uh, uh, spatial issues within Tarabi, on community spaces. Uh, and uh, what, because people makes, make Tarabi so strong and they are the social heroes on the community level. And I think the community level is the most important level and the government, of course, they also have to interact, but the community, the people living there uh, made, has, uh, have, uh, have, have made Dharavi so successful, also in this crisis. So I would like to introduce you to Binod. Uh, he is also one part of Anukruti. He is a young engineer. And he says, I live in an, in an, uh, in an SRA building on the 90 feet route. That's one of the main roads in Harabi. We are privileged to have our own space and social distancing in a four persons household is fine. I talk to my neighbors and community members to bring awareness about being dis disciplined for and with others. We have to practice social distancing, wash our hands regularly and keep ourselves and the community space clean. It is tough, but we have to practice community participation on the ground level now. Another uh, good example is Mary Yacinda. She's a social worker and uh, she says, 
I see the problems every day right on my doorstep. People living here have to come out twice a day for food and to use the toilets. So you can imagine how tough it is to practice social distancing. I'm focused on overseeing the cleaning process of the neighborhood's toilet complexes and to keep it clean. Each is visited by at least 1,000 people a day. It shows that sanitation is still a big issue here in Harari, but in all other slum settlements in Mumbai as well. And the third is Kulza. He lives on Muslim Chok and uh, he has he has a tuition. He, he leads tuition classes and uh, he says, I'm a social activist and hold tuition classes for my community. I'm teaching children about ne the ne necessity of physical distance, which is so much needed to protect our elderly dweller, dwellers in Harari. I work to improve conditions here. I have been working to help those affected by the pandemic, handing out bags of rice, flour, cooking oil and sugar, enough to feed a family for two weeks. So all these three are very good examples for what Taravi is, uh, is out of, people from different social religious backgrounds. And they have built up Taravi and they are also go strong together now in this crisis. So, um, what are possible social solutions? I would like to uh, introduce you. I call it social acupuncture and spatial acupuncture is important on the government and neighborhood level. So uh, solutions on the community level, uh, Daravi's strength lies in its communities organized and set up by the inhabitants themselves. That's a very, very, uh, very special strength of Daravi and other informal settlements in Mumbai and beyond as well. And the support and strengthen the capacities is so important of these social heroes. These are only three examples, but there are many, many more on the community level who are working so hard. And they also know better what the situation on the ground is really like. Of course, the other level, the government top-down level is also very important and they have to work closely together. So social workers and community leaders on a formal or also informal level should talk to pe people in an informal way to bring awareness about the current problems within the settlement. And the very, very key issue to address is common sense. Folders, posters and handouts in cooperation with NGOs, graphic design colleges, which are explained by the stakeholders, will reach out as many dwellers as possible. And I think, uh, you know, I'm also a professor on several uh, architecture and design colleges. I think this would be also a great opportunity for design and architecture students to uh, get this hands on experience with people, with inhabitants on site and also to experience uh, this situation together, to help and to do something together. And what are, what are uh, possible spatial solutions? This is called, I would call it spatial ac ac acupuncture on the government and neighborhood level. So solutions on the uh, community level could be to transform schools and community centers into, into COVID-19 centers for affected people, what has already been done and use further existing community spaces within the settlements like balwadis and schools and define distribute the space in a new way elderly must be separated from the younger ones to keep them protected this concept has already recently successfully applied and uh, on the government level very very important improve the infrastructure hygienic conditions are still very very bad and include practicing architects and students, also urban designers and planners uh, for new design concepts to come up with innovative ideas related to physical distancing. And also there are a lot of neighborhoods around Harawi like Mahim and Matunga make existing parks accessible in the surrounding neighborhoods for new and flexible design concepts, e.g. modular systems like uh, also the Bauhaus in Germany uh, created them in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, you know, very, very fast. Uh, you can equip a park in a very fast speed and you can dismantle it also in the same way. So my suggestion is, of course, work proactively rather than reactively. The strict lockdown and ex accessible testing was the Ravi strategy to bring the numbers down. 
and by the 14th of June, almost almost 700,000 people uh, screened were screened and set up, uh, and fever clinics clinics were set up. Those showing symptoms were shifted to nearby schools and sports clubs, converted into quarantine centers. Fresh daily infections are now down to a third comp compared with early May. More than half the sick are recovered and the number of deaths plum plummeted this month. About 51% of residents who test positive, pos positive eventually recovered, better than Mumbai's 41% rate. Fresh infections are down to an average 20 a day from 16 early May. These positive actions are all based on the community level, and they should be more highlighted by the government to help reducing the social stigma, people living in informal settlements, and uh, also, uh, of course, highlighted by the media. What can we learn from Tarabi? So, in the whole scenery, be a social hero. When social distancing is not possible, we have to work on new spatial concepts, especially for the urban informal settlements. It is a challenge, but it can be successful when all stakeholders closely work together, the government and community level, also architects, urban designers, professors, students, everyone. Common sense is the key issue for successful social and spatial acupuncture. And uh, Susmit Mohanty, she's an architect and also urban designer. She posted a nice, um, uh, a nice. Po she made a nice post today on Facebook. I would like to read out. I have always found the residents of Tharavi entrepreneurial, industrious, re resilient, and very supportive of each other in their close knit communities. I can totally see them cooperating with the local authorities to st stem the spread and adapting as they go, while supporting each other in these difficult times. The well-to-do who live in spacious homes, neighborhoods, often look down on those living in slums, but instead they should stop being condescending and learn a thing or two from them. Even visit Tarawi in good times. So I would like to close our session and uh, wait, ah, here, sorry. <laughs> and I, I would like to... Uh, ask and to, to also uh, motivate you to create new social and spatial strategies together. I'm always open. I can come any, anywhere and you know now uh, in these webinars, we can also work closely together, what is wonderful. And uh, I thank you and I wish you all the best. Stay happy and healthy. Thank you very much, ma'am, for sharing current situation and challenges of COVID-19 in Dharawai, which is one of the biggest and populated slum in Asia. Indeed, yeah. the preventive measures such as social distancing is nearly impossible in such densely populated area. Yeah. You also highlighted how endeavors at uh, community level by local residents can help in safeguarding each other from this global crisis. Also, thank you for highlighting new possibilities to contain the COVID-19 in, in such densely populated areas. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation. <laughs> now, I will like to invite our last speaker of the day, uh, Professor Surya Prakash. Professor Surya Prakash is doctorate in art science with specialization in geohazard risk management from Indian Institute of Technology, Roorkee. He has been team leader for World Center for Excellence on Landslide Disaster Reduction, conferred by International Consortium on Landslides to NIDM, and also the project leader for IPL uh, 172 under International Program on Landslide, jointly approved by UNESCO and ICL. He is currently head of geometrological risk management TV faculty in charge of three specialized centers. for coastal disaster risk reduction and resilience, as well as his coordinating faculty for eight central ministries. Over to you, sir. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my former speakers have actually elaborated most of the issues. Since we are running short of time, I'll quickly go through this PowerPoint so that we can have some questions and answers within the available limited time. 
so i am not, not going to repeat what has been said by others but trying to state that what uh, dr martina said instead of slums the word informal settlements would be better for these uh, densely populated areas within the cities that have mushrooms due to migration uh, of the people from other areas and uh, most of these people actually although uh, very socially uh, conducive but have uh, am I professor surya sir sir we are unable to Is my get your audio now sir? am i audible yes sir yes sir yes sir. yes sir okay, you are audible now let me skip my powerpoint just express in 5 minutes my opinion on this that this uh, slums or uh, informal settlements which are highly densely populated areas are uh, scarce of resources have to actually uh, depend on their social goodwill as uh, martina also said that there has to be social volunteers and leaders who can actually guide them to take appropriate actions in this covid-19 situation as rightly is pointed out by her that we don't need just uh, the covid healthcare management but also the techniques of spatial and social acupuncture because these are the crisis not only in terms of health management but in terms of space available to them and social resources available with them and no doubt people who are well equipped with resources they can come forward and help these people in alleviating this problem during this crisis situation the other issue which need to uh, have attention is the public facilities in terms of toilets and styles and habits in terms of our working as well as our living so as uh, proposed by previous speakers that we can uh, know the space constraints but instead of sleeping towards each other we can sleep in opposite sides so that we do not face each other and reduce the chances of uh, spread of the infection so these are some of the suggestions so i'll uh, try to conclude here with because of shortage of time and would request you to kindly take up the questions few questions that we can take up within limited time i think uh, one question for each speaker you can ask okay thank you, you sir for your input a uh, quick insight uh, insight in on covid 19 situation uh, this question is for dr saurav dalal what is the role of local level medical system why government not strengthening whole mechanism what is steps to be taken by government to stop covid 19 at local level transmission dr saurabh dalal dr sachin rewaria yes please uh can you answer this question uh okay uh, so uh, you know uh, we have been uh, am i audible you are audible okay uh, we have been talking about uh, you know uh, the importance of uh, various uh, public health measures in uh, reducing uh, the uh, spread and uh, if i talk about uh, urban settings i think uh, what is going to be important is that uh, we uh, expand the testing and uh, in situations where home isolation is not a practical solution uh, expand our institutional isolation mechanisms so uh, that is probably uh, the the uh, way to go in addition to the uh, uh, public health interventions like uh, physical distancing Uh, um, hand hygiene and cough etiquette that must be followed by all i think uh, going ahead what is going to be important is what i said uh, testing uh, to be enhanced and in cases where uh, home isolation is not possible expand uh, the availability of uh, beds for appropriate institutional isolation that is that is my thought uh, there uh, the others may add on uh, 
if there is uh, anything that they would want to add. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my next question is to Martina, ma'am. This pandemic is spread, spreading exponentially now. How come business be managed in the urban center as the people living in urban areas depend largely on private sector on their livelihood from small and large business enterprises? This is a very good question. And I was talking to a lot of little, uh, you know, um, entrepreneurs, uh, Gujaratis yesterday only on the phone. They are completely desperate because the social and economical stigma at the moment is so big that they can't, they have, they produce pots and everything. And also other, a lot of entrepreneurs as well, of course, within Harabi, but uh, people are so scared. And the two factors are definitely the government should destigmatize uh, Harabi and all the other urban settlements, you know, uh, which are really very, very productive and uh, live on these little small scale economies. And second is the media, you know, because we only every day I listen, uh, I, whenever I switch on the TV, something negative is coming up, you know. So they should be also very cooperative and uh, take the stigma out of it because th these are our own sources right now. We are all sitting in our comfortable homes and watch TVs or uh, watch TV or um, uh, get our news from WhatsApp or you know from all other sources or friends. So this is a that these two parameters are very important. They should really, really be proactive and help these communities. And of course, uh, social distancing in these communities is a big challenge, no doubt. But they really try everything. I spoke with three potters yesterday, and they said, "Ma'am, we really try everything." Nowadays, a lot of migrants are uh, in their home villages, anyways. So also the workshops they have slightly bigger, um, uh, bigger spaces now. Yeah, so for the for the migrant workers, but it's very tough. And this question is, I, if I can, if if I uh, if I'm able to solve it, I would solve it like this. <laughs> so my thing is that I. Uh, um, uh, I buy from from the potters and from the people I know, and they deliver it to home. And these are small little acts what we can do as consumers, but it's very tough for them, no doubt. It's very tough. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. Our last question is to Dr. Uh, Professor Surya Prakash. What's the criteria for listing a particular area in containment zone or hot spot? And despite of creation of facilities, what is the reason of increasing cases? Okay, this criteria actually has been uh, earlier fixed by Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Wherever we had uh, the, more than 15 cases, so it was declared as a hotspot area. And uh, containment areas were de declared as we had more than five cases like that. So these cases actually uh, were the criteria decided at the central level earlier. But now, uh, the uh, facility, uh, this uh, freedom has been given to the states and the local administration. So the containment areas are decided by the local administration and the state administration uh, to contain the spread of the disease because now we have gone in unlock uh, phase. So now the, uh, the livelihood and other activities are open and people are going to their workplaces. So in order to allow them to continue their activities and also to contain the spread of the diseases, the decisions are taken at the local level so that the disease doesn't get spread out. So now it is more on the public, the citizens and the local administration to contain the spread of this, this disease uh, than the uh, central level authorities. From the central government, uh, the uh, built up of the resources in terms of resilient infrastructure and uh, requirement of uh, more testing facilities and uh, pro personal protective equipment, ventilators, etc. has been made up. So they are doing in this manner. I hope uh, I'm clear in my communication. Thank you. 
थैंक यू वेरी मच सर now i would like to invite executive director of national institute of disaster management to kindly give his concluding remark a really uh, good seminar a uh, webinar uh, for last one and a half hours uh, so many good points came out and with so much of practical experiences of dhara v of delhi and overall in general and uh, uh, mr krishna watsa from ndma also gave out Uh, certain linkages uh, i would like to conclude by saying that uh, we have been blaming density of population at many a forums as being uh, the driver of the infection it has was proved adequately by uh, shri krishna watsa ji that it is not uh, am i audible yes sir you are audible could you hear what i said earlier yes sir yes sir okay so uh, what i'm saying is uh, the uh, fa- the uh, idea that we were harboring the density is directly responsible for the increase in uh, infections is not uh, is not correct it has been proved wrong time and again by the examples which uh, krishna watsa ji gave and by what uh, dr martina also explained how dara we was consoled which has one of the densest population uh, as far as per square kilometer is seen uh, nearly Two lakh, I think, in one square kilometer or something. Uh, that that it beats that whole myth that density is the key driver to this population. Uh, it is, I think, uh, uh, from this uh, particular webinar, what comes out is a proactive interventions, uh, which were explained by uh, Dr. Martina, and then what now Delhi is now taking, and uh, in Ch- what happened in Chennai and in Bangalore, uh, both medical and non-medical. is the key to the whole thing and in that uh, the participation of the community uh, that awareness campaign the motivation the persuasion taking them along bringing them on to the table and uh, making them an equal stakes partner uh, has helped wherever these things have been a participatory approach has been taken uh, things have been successful uh, so it finally brings out that cooperation and collaboration between the state the local government the uh, community based organizations the civil society organizations and the community itself is a must to control this pandemic uh, uh, so that everyone is ready to accept the restrictions is ready to accept the constraints being put on them and is also uh, ready to be a social hero as uh, three examples we were shown uh, to motivate others to do the same uh, only by this concentrated effort i think we can get out of the pandemic otherwise no amount of testing or uh, surveillance will help us unless the community uh, has taken on board and they are with the program being laid out by the government uh, so uh, i think we should all work towards uh, cooperation and collaboration of community with the multi stakeholders i think that can we can have a, a webinar on that itself that how we can increase that um, uh, collaboration or how can we have a participatory approach uh, to such issues with the help of community uh, i thank all the speakers for such lucid and uh, enlightening talks and uh, so uh, to the point and crystal clear in their thought process uh, and the questions that were asked were also very knowledgeable and uh, i thank dr surya prakash and uh, mr anil kathet uh, for organizing this program and for who for collaborating with us thank you to everyone stay safe thank you very much sir for your concluding remarks at the outset i would like to thank executive director of nit major general manoj kumar pindal for his continuous support and guidance in our every endeavor on behalf of national institute of disaster management and world health organization i take this opportunity to thank our speakers uh, dr martina spice dr saurabh dalal dr sachin revaria and professor surya prakash who share their valuable time share their expertise on the theme of the webinar with us i also take this opportunity to thank honorable member and dma shri krishna watsa for sharing the current uh, covid 19 situation in dens densely populated mega cities of india
i express a deep sense of gratitude gratitude to all our participants i hope every stakeholder will have some take away from this webinar see you all at the fourth webinar of the series on tuesday 23 june 2020 thank you all for joining us in this webinar thank you all thank you thank you